Ladies and gentlemen, today I'd like to talk to you about your brain. Now raise your hand if you have a brain. Uh, those of you who haven't raised your hand yet, I'm a little worried about you. Keep them up. Come on. Okay. Good. This, this is going to make my talk a lot easier to understand. Okay. Now keep, keep your hands up if you've ever wondered how your brain actually works. Okay? Keep it up if you've wondered how your brain works. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So thank you. You can put your hands down. So this is something that we have in common. This is actually the same starting point that I had in my career back when I was originally interested in how to make computer programs work like the way that we think. And then I moved into understanding the biology of the brain. So I'd like to start our story today about 120 years ago with a Spanish neuroscientist, one of the first, uh, named Ramon uh, Ramon y Cajal, Santiago Ramon y Cajal. And about this time, he was one of the first people to actually look at the fine structure of the nervous system, to be able to see how neurons form these beautiful branching patterns like you see here. He was looking under the microscope and drawing these by hand. And for this work, he won the Nobel Prize, giving us our first insight into what might be going on inside brains. Snap forward to the 1950s. Watson and Crick, two geneticists, discovered the double helix structure uh, of DNA and won the Nobel Prize for this. Um, but the lure of understanding how our brain work was too much for one of them, Francis Crick, and he actually shifted from genetics into the field of neuroscience. And he came to the Salk Institute in San Diego, California, where I'm visiting you from today. And he started to look at the vast body of work in neuroscientists in neuroscience to try to understand how the brain worked. And in 1994, he published something that he called the Astonishing Hypothesis, which was this. It was, a person's mental activities are entirely due to the behavior of nerve cells, glial cells, which are also in the brain, and the atoms, ions, and molecules that make them up and influence them. Now, he wasn't the first neuroscientist to think this, but I like the way that he put it together. And it turns out that in the last hundred years of neuroscience research, of looking in the brain, we've never found anything that is inconsistent with this picture. But I was curious about how technology, the wonderful technology that we have today, might help us understand this a bit further. If in fact, our entire mental activities are really due to cells, then that tells us that it pushes the question back, which is how do these cells actually work? And could technology help us understand that? So I'm gonna do an experiment on you today. I'm gonna perform some surgery, okay? Don't worry, it won't hurt. I know we just met, but I'm a doctor, okay? So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna open up your skull, okay? and we're going to take one of your neurons in your brain, and we're gonna replace that neuron with computer code that does exactly the same thing that that neuron does. Now, I'm gonna ask you two questions. The first question is, have I changed your identity? Are you a different person because I have taken one of your neurons out and I've replaced it with some computer, some computer code? You might say, well, Stephen, I have like trillions of neurons. If you do this with just one neuron, I probably wouldn't feel the difference. Okay, maybe. Second question, would I have learned something about your brain? Well, maybe I could, you know, take you, put you in front of a movie, I'd see what you were thinking at uh, TEDx, but I'd only have one neuron to look at, so maybe I wouldn't have that much information. Okay, let's take this one step further. What if we replaced a second neuron, a third neuron, a fourth neuron? What if we replaced a third of your neurons, all with computer code, again, doing exactly what these cells did? Okay, what if I went and I just replaced your whole brain, okay? <laughs> all of the nerve cells in your brain with computer code that did exactly the same thing that your neurons did. Well, let's ask these questions again. Have I changed who you are? Ooh, well, <laughs> uh, we have to really believe in our hypothesis uh, if we're going to accept this. But if it's true, uh, if I just take every single cell and I turn into computer code, you'd be the same person. But now, you'd be uploaded in the computer. Well, this is still a lot of speculation. But let's look at the second question. What would I have learned? Would I have been able to learn something more than what I know today? And the answer is probably we'd learn a lot. If we could see everything that you were thinking, it, Every moment, we'd be able to see it all in a computer. We'd be able to learn so much about how our brains work and maybe be able to see if this hypothesis is true. Well, uh, this experiment can't be done today, and I don't know how many of you would volunteer to sign up for this particular experiment. Frankly, our technology today just doesn't let us do this. But interestingly, our story progresses to 2010, when a friend of mine made a pretty crazy announcement on Twitter. He said this. He said, this is the tweet. He said, in 2011, my New Year's resolution is that I'm going to simulate the brain of an entire organism that only has 300 neurons in it. 
And I saw this and I thought, wow, this is actually brilliant. This would be a first step towards exactly that kind of thought experiment. If you could take an animal and it only has 300 neurons, well, that shouldn't be too hard and you'd need to do that anyway if you were gonna get to the step of understanding our brains a little bit better, right? But then there was this thing, he said, C. elegans. It was like, I'm going to do the brain of C. elegans. And I had heard of that, but I didn't exactly know what it was. So I went online, started Googling, and I looked it up. And it turned out that there had been another Nobel Prize given out for work on this C. elegans thing. In fact, the winner of the Nobel Prize, in his acceptance speech, there was two other scientists with him. He said, he said without doubt, the fourth winner of the Nobel Prize this year is C. elegans. And when I found out that C. elegans is a microscopic worm as long as a hair on your head is wide, it occurred to me that a microscopic worm with 300 neurons had just won the Nobel Prize, and what was I doing with my life? <laughs> so after recovering from a deep depression, I found out that this animal actually is pretty interesting, right? It actually does all the things that you'd expect an animal can do with only 300 neurons. It manages to, you know, have sensation, it goes, it looks uh, for mates, it finds food, it finds itself in a really complicated microscopic world. It has to avoid a fungus that likes to trap it inside a little noose, uh, like you're seeing here. This is what happens when it doesn't do it right. But when it does it right, uh, if you see there, here's the guy who's almost getting trapped in the noose and then he finds his way to pull himself out and he doesn't get eaten by the fungus today. Okay, so pretty impressive stuff for only 300 neurons, right? So it turns out that over the years, there's a thousand labs that have looked into this animal. It was the first animal that we mapped its entire genome. It's one of the first animals where we know how it grows up from one single cell up to the thousand cells that it has. We know every single cell division. And those neurons that I told you about, the 302 neurons, well, guess what? This animal, of all animals that we know about on the planet, we've mapped it out to the nth degree. We know, we've given names to all the neurons, we know where they are and what positions they lie in in the body, and it's the only animal still to date that we have every single connection between every single neuron mapped out at a high detail. But I wondered, we could do this for a worm, but would it really teach us anything about human beings? Would it really teach us anything about ourselves? And it took no less than the great German philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche, to answer this question for us. Now, he was not a biologist, but he said something that I think is pretty relevant to this. He said in some of his writings, you have made your way from worm to man, and much of you is still worm. <laughs> well, having a look at his portrait, I think I know what part of him was still the man. <laughs> man, that thing is beautiful. Look at that thing, it's luscious. I think it won some competitions back in the day. Beautiful mustache, okay. But seriously, if he had been a biologist, he might have done this in a different way. He might have said, let's look at all the genes in the human and all the genes that are in the worm and let's compare them. And what you find when you do that is it turns out that 60 to 80% of the genes that are inside you have homologs or similar genes in this worm. So if Nietzsche had been a biologist, he would have said, you have made your way from worm to man and 60 to 80% of you is still worm. So armed with this information, uh, my friends and I decided to start a project that we called OpenWorm, which is a project to build the world's first digital organism in a computer, specifically C. elegans, a microscopic worm with only a thousand cells in its whole body. Now it turns out that we were armed with the fact that technology and software has been getting so good that we can deal with really complicated devices. So if you see here, we can take the three million parts in a jet airliner and we can put it in a computer, not just animate it like you'd see in Pixar, but we can actually test computers, uh, we can test devices like this inside computers. We can give mass and force and we can create devices so that we can have a pretty good sense of how they're gonna work. In fact, it's gotten so good that last year, airline companies have announced that they've been able to go directly from the computer design, skip the step of the physical prototype they might test in a wind tunnel, and go directly to assembly. Now, this might worry you if you do a lot of traveling on planes, but I assure you that they would not do this if it didn't work. Uh, so it just shows you that the software is really getting quite good. And armed with this, we felt like we could go to the step of building a whole digital organism to start to approach this, and we realized we needed to go from this nervous system, these nerve cells, and we needed to build out a whole body. We needed to build a body for this worm so we could understand how the neurons react in an environment. Uh, in fact, you know, at the end of the day, nerve cells are just there to move a body around in the world. We took a step back from this, though, and we realized, is it possible that what we're proposing is to build the world's first worm matrix? An environment where a nervous system would not know if it was in the real world or if it was in a virtual world. 
But seriously, we wanted to understand how, like in that thought experiment, if we put all those neurons inside of a computer and we watched how that worm crawled, how it did what it did, could we unpack something deeper? Could we unpack a mathematical principle that helped us understand how neurons work in general, something that we could apply back to the human being? Well, we realized that we were doing all this in software. We had an opportunity unlike any other, which is that we could not just do this amongst ourselves, because this is a really challenging thing to do, even with your two neurons. We could invite the world, anyone with a computer and an internet connection, to join us in our virtual lab to help us build this digital simulation together. And we turned to technologies like GitHub, where we could share every line of computer code that we were writing up online so, we, so everybody in the world can see how we build this as we build it, line by line. And we interacted and reached out with folks on social media. And we put all our meetings up online through Google Hangouts up on YouTube. And we had scientific discussions that the whole world could see. And as a consequence, the community that's built up around OpenWorm has been the most exciting thing about the project to date, with collaborations from major universities to help from companies like Amazon and Google. Um, we've built a, a community of folks that are really no different from you. Uh, anybody with the curiosity to wonder, how do our brains work, have been our community members, from students to non-students, from coders to non-coders, biologists to non-biologists. We've had hundreds of contributions over the last four years, all joining in this project trying to understand how this little worm works. So we wanted to close the loop from the activity of neurons to the activity of the muscles that those neurons touch, all the way to the behavior of a body and all the way back to the behavior of those neurons. So how would we do this? Well, we need some data. If we're gonna do some science, we need some data. So we turned to some collaborators who, get this, had taken 10,000 movies of worms crawling around on dishes. I know, this is not your idea of a Saturday night out at the movies, okay? But for a scientist, this gets us really excited because this is a lot of data. And this data lets us do something you can't do for any other animal, which is to build up a very detailed mathematical description of what a worm does when it's running around in the world. We've taken that and built a simulation environment, a lot like what I showed you with the aircraft, where we actually have a worm in three dimensions that can interact with water, that has muscles that can actually pull and bend its body. Again, this is not a Pixar animation. This is a simulation with real physics behind it. And we've been able to use this as our body and our world environment. And then that nervous system that I told you about, well, we've unpacked that too, and we've been able to put up online probably the most complete representation of a nervous system that you can actually fire up in your computer and start to see how it works and start to see it come to life. So it turned out that maybe our worm matrix was possible. Uh, we uh, started with a simulated world, uh, with a simulated wor uh, worm body. We had done that. We made great progress on this nervous system. Uh, we continue to add to it as it goes. And all that's left is for us to plug our brain into our matrix and see how it goes. And this is work that's still in progress. But you might be saying to yourself, hey, this sounds great, but it's really kind of complicated and I don't think I could really interact with it, you know, and maybe I don't know coding, maybe I don't know biology. Well, we saw this as a problem uh, for folks, the ability to really access into it, and we realized that folks maybe needed to have it simpler. So if you're able to make two clicks, uh, you'd be able to use what I'm gonna show you next. We're really excited to present here, for the first time in a major audience, our solution to that problem. We've worked really hard on what I'm gonna show you next, uh, it's called WormSim, and we think it's going to help to make this whole experience of observing what it's like to build a digital organism much more accessible. So I present to you WormSim. excited for WormSim. We've put it out to the 
backers of our Kickstarter campaign already. And if you go to wormsim.org, you can click on it as well. If, you didn't, if, if it wasn't obvious, uh, Wormsim takes the progress that we've made with OpenWorm and it makes it available to you in your browser so you can play with the worm, see it wiggling, explore its cells just with two clicks. So what we've done is we've gone from the curiosity that we all share about how your brains work to a Nobel Prize winning worm. And we've explored the possibility that maybe building a worm matrix might not be the craziest way to try and make progress in understanding how our own minds work. But what's really been the most exciting thing about this is the community that's formed. And I'm really just one representative of really the efforts of hundreds of people who share that same curiosity and have picked up a virtual shovel and found a way to join in this effort. So I invite you to join us as well. Come to openworm.org, reach out to us on social media, and help us build the world's first digital organism in a computer. Thank you so much, and I'll see you online.